do not pray that the persecution would stop, but the gospel would continue to go out and transform lives. Well, this shocked me. Why would you not want the persecution to stop? The simple answer is that he saw the gospel was more effective at being spread when persecution came. And Paul sees the same. Paul expects the same. And Paul tells the Philippian church to expect the same. Which is why he says in verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's probably the key verse in the chapter, and one that we can come back to and remember when times are tough. So when we see the church in Afghanistan, or in Nigeria, or China, or other places, facing severe persecution, maybe even martyrdom, how are they to live and act? When we see the laws changing in our land that will lead to persecution, loss of jobs, loss of relationship with friends and family members, how are we to live and act? when we are called bigots because we make a stand against people changing their sexuality just because they feel this is their identity. How are we to live and act then? How are we to defend the truth that the Bible clearly teaches and rather than follow the world or follow those churches that become liberal by saying, well, it was clearly written for a different time, instead of standing on the truth of the Bible as God's holy, infallible word and saying, God says, how else are these people to see that their identity is to be in Christ if we don't go through this light affliction? Maybe it's even more straightforward than this. Our own personal circumstances that we're in, where we live, our occupation, our place of education, our health, isn't what we'd have chosen for ourselves. Or maybe we've got into the everyday repetitiveness of life. And we can't quite see our role in the community or the spread of the gospel. But our attitude towards them makes all the difference. And through them, God is telling us to only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And I think Paul, as always, is very clever in the way that he sets out the epistle. He builds the readers up to this point, and at a very high level it reads... In verses 12 to 17, he lays out his circumstances. In verses 18 to 26, his attitude towards his circumstances. Before hitting us in verses 27 to 30, saying, so because of all of this, make the stand. And I think it's a mindset that Paul wants each of us to get into. It's a Christ-like mindset. It's who Paul always points us towards. And it brings us joy. We've already seen some great truths in verses 1 to 11, that we are saints and this should shape how we live in all aspects of our lives, that we are safe in Christ, that we are in this world but not of this world and others should see us as different, that we should partnership with one another and strive to spread the gospel and this should be ongoing, and that God is at work in his churches and in our own lives and he will finish what he has started. So let's take a closer look. We can see in verses 12 to 14 that regardless of Paul's circumstances, the gospel continues to advance. Paul was in prison. He was being held prisoner by the Roman authorities. And from our immediate view, we might think, well, that stopped Paul spreading the gospel. And the Philippian church hearing this might think the same. Paul is chained day and night to a Roman soldier. How could he evangelize? How can he spread God's word? But in verse 12, we read these astonishing words. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the thing which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Furtherance of the gospel? How is that possible? Well, God is using Paul's imprisonment for the Roman guards to hear the gospel. It's highly likely the Roman soldiers wouldn't have gone out to seek Paul or any other evangelist for that matter. So God brings Paul to them. Paul's prison ministry is now up and running. The hymns that he might have sung, the conversations that he might have had with others such as Timothy. We can see from verse 1 that Timothy was with him. His attitude to his imprisonment, 
what he says as others are used as scribes to write these epistles. And the chained Roman soldiers hear these words. The Roman guards can't get away from him. It's not Paul that's trapped, it's them. Chained to Paul for their whole shift. These uncouth, sweaty, burly, trained killing machines were coming in direct contact with probably the greatest evangelist who had hours to tell him of their need to come to Christ. And you can just picture each of these Roman guards going off duty, either home or talking to the other Roman soldiers. I've been stuck with this guy called Paul. There's something different about him. He's telling me of my need to come to Christ. He's, he told me that I need to put my trust in Jesus for all the wrong things that I've done. He's told me that Jesus is God. I think there might be something in it. And before you know it, Paul is the talk of the Roman soldiers, and the gospel has advanced into the Roman army. And we can remember that Philippian jailer who may have had a wry smile on his face as the epistle was read out. We know from Paul's time in Philippi in Acts 16 that during his time in prison in Philippi, God did amazing things, and the jailer and his household were converted. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. No, at this time, Paul was preaching to all those that were in earshot. During this particular imprisonment of around two years, it's thought that Paul wrote the epistles to the Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. God's word was certainly not chained. And you can only begin to imagine the effect that these epistles have had on the world over the many years since. Paul may not have chosen prison, but God had. And God wasn't going to let it stop the advance the gospel and here's a vital lesson for each of us today whatever our circumstance especially those that we might not have thought right for ourselves whether that's where we work our health our neighborhood our home the university that wasn't our first choice that we might want to be closer to our grandchildren and so on God has placed each of us into these positions and wants to use us to advance the gospel where we are through our individual circumstances. So it's important that we have the right mindset, a Christ-like mindset, as Paul did. And we can see the impact in verse 13 where it says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And Paul uses that familiar phrase, in Christ. The AV says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. The newer translation of the Bible loses this sense of being in Christ and therefore water down Paul's meaning. In other words, it was his union with Christ that had made him a prisoner because he was in Christ. Your union with Christ has placed you in these positions or you have these circumstances because of your union with Christ. And as we show the outside world our Christ-like attitude, they should see us as different. John 13, verse 7 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So we can trust Christ in all things, even when they don't seem clear to us. But this advancement of the gospel had shown itself up in a different way. As we can see from verse 14, where it says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. We know that Paul was in prison. Paul couldn't go out and evangelize like he had before. But his imprisonment had emboldened others to speak the word without fear. And one school of thought is because Paul was a Roman citizen and the protection that was given to him because of this, it had encouraged the other Roman Christians to do the same. But in all reality, Paul was working through his people to advance the gospel. And God works in very different ways to how we might think. We think everything must be perfect before God can work and the gospel can be spread. But God is saying to us that whatever our circumstance, he can use each of us to advance his gospel. And we must have a change of attitude and see that God will use us as witness to those that are around us. And maybe that's something each of us need to consider today. In verses 15 to 18, we can see that people were using Paul's position 
for different motives. And one thing to point out here is that these were not people that were spreading a false gospel. Paul never stood for someone spreading a false gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And we should have the same attitude and not stand for false doctrine. These were people that were using Paul's imprisonment wrongly, by envy and rivalry. But there were those that preached Christ out of goodwill. Paul says in verse 16 that the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But verse 17, verse 17 says, But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So what were these people doing? Why were they treating the Apostle Paul like this? Well, even in Christian circles, self, selfish ambition can still get in. People want credit for things they haven't done. People like to be seen to be in charge or important. People can't stop themselves putting others down. And this is the sinful nature that we still have, or we will have until, verse 6 says, until the day of Jesus Christ. And maybe it went something like this. Look at the position Paul finds himself in now. I said a while back not to follow the way he was evangelizing. There's no need to be so bold. He's just causing problems and uproar. Follow how I evangelize. You won't end up like Paul. He thinks he's special, calling himself an apostle. But Paul says in verse 18, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Because the gospel is spread, and Christ is preached, I don't let it be me. If they want to knock me down, and the gospel is able to be spread further because of it, then so be it. That is what is important. I can therefore rejoice that Christ is preached. In verses 19 to 21, we can see that Paul was able to find his reasons for joy. Paul's sole aim in life was to see the good news of Jesus Christ being spread. And this was regardless of those that might have other motives behind what they were doing. And he wants the readers of the epistles to remember that nothing should diminish the joy and peace when they first became a Christian, or the ongoing joy and peace that can be found in Jesus Christ. And he wasn't going to let these jealous people take that away from him. His joy is based on three things. Firstly, in verse 19 we see, For I know that this, will sh this shall turn to my salvation. Paul is saying that in this verse that he will be saved. And this will bring him joy. Well, the big question we might ask here, is Paul talking about getting out of prison or where his eternity lies? And the rest of the verse might direct us a little. It says, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And I think it's pointed towards that he was thinking about the upcoming trial and being let free. We can also see in verse 25 where it says, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance of joy and joy of faith. However, we can see in the Bible that Job uses the term salvation for that moment when he will stand before the mighty God. It says in Job 13, verse 16, he, shall be my, he also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. And Job here is saying that he knows he will be saved when he stands before God and that day of judgment, so he isn't referring to an earthly trial. We know that Paul was well versed in the Old Testament. And the best conclusion is that he, he was looking at both aspects of this, whether it be an earthly or heavenly trial. He would be saved or delivered. Secondly, in verse 20, we see these words. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. In everything, Paul saw that Christ was to be put first and lifted high, honoured, and this gave him great joy. Paul's chief goal in life since his dramatic conversion was to magnify Christ. Paul, wherever he went, was looking to make Christ known. It's no different to John the Baptist. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. But can we say this in our own lives? Do we look to magnify Christ wherever we are? 
May Christ increase and us decrease in all our walks of life, in every aspect. And then maybe we'll see the same joy that Paul experienced when he exalted Christ. And thirdly, in verse 21, we read that well-known verse. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Christ meant more to him than anything else. And were he to live, it was to tell more people of Christ. And to die would be his gain. He would be with Christ. He would joy at spreading the gospel further if he was given the chance, or experience unending joy should he die and be with Christ for all eternity. In fact, verse 23 says, he is in a strait betwixt two, and that being with Christ is far better. For the Christian, we have that unending joy to look forward to, regardless of our present situations. Isn't that worth telling others about? So living for Christ also gave, gave Paul great joy. When you, became, when you become a Christian, you're now making a lifelong commitment to putting Christ first. This means personal sacrifice to self. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.15, And that he died for all, that they which live should no, not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That great love that Christ has shown each of us Christians should be enough to compel us to live for him. And by doing so, we should experience that joy that Paul speaks of. But only Christians can say those words. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you're not a Christian today, what gain can you have from dying? What joy will you experience when you pass away from this world? Well, it doesn't matter what achievements you have, a great job, a healthy bank balance, a well-traveled retirement. God has made it very clear through his word that it's only those that are saved and safe in Christ that will experience this everlasting joy that Paul looks forward to, that I look forward to. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and we'll be judged righteously by God's standards, not our own. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 has these frightening words about when Jesus will return. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that not know, know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. If you're not a Christian today, take heed of these frightening words. They're not my words. They are God's words. There's an urgency in these words. You need to take action. If you don't know Christ, but these words have made you sit up and think, get to know him. Ask to speak to someone in this church who I can assure you wants to make Christ known to you and can tell you more about him. Or is this the first time you've seen your need for Christ? It's God opening your heart. Make that commitment to him today. Only he can forgive all our wrongdoings. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe after today you can say those words with me. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you're a Christian... Shouldn't those verses in 2 Thessalonians compel us to tell more about Jesus and the need for him? What joy we receive when one sinner comes to Christ. With verses 22 to 26, we can see Paul's and our human tendency, but also each of our own personal responsibility. Anyone who reads any of Paul's epistles in the New Testament would know that Paul's whole life was centred on Jesus Christ. For want of a better term, he did all he could to imitate Christ, which in turn drew others to see how they should live in light of being a Christian. Paul fully submitted to the will of Christ. And this is a calling for each of us to fully submit ourselves to the will of Christ. Paul wasn't sure what his personal preference to his ongoing situation was. And this is why he says those words in verse 22. But if I live in the flesh... This is fruit of my labour, yet what I shall choose, I wot not. 
you see there's now tension between the will of himself and seeking the will of God. And our question to ourselves should always be, what is God's will in this? Whether the decision is seemingly big or small, we must always seek God's will. And it's good to see that Paul wrestles with these earthly questions himself. Well, the Reformed preacher Sinclair Ferguson gives us a practical way of seeking God's will. When he writes on this verse, he says, When we are conscientiously seeking to discern the will of God, place side by side columns the answers to two questions. Question one, what are my natural desires, preferences and instincts in this situation? Question two, what responsibilities do I have in terms of my home, my family role, in my church, stewardship of my gifts, and experience in the past? He goes on to say, often simply listing the answer to these questions helps a Christian have a clearer sense of God's direction, all other things being equal. But in reality, Paul was going to have to do that difficult Christian thing and wait on the Lord and see how his own circumstance and his future trial would direct his life. So he's torn between the two, to be with Christ or to continue his ministry. And let's take both of them in isolation. Firstly, to be with Christ. We've already seen that in verse 21 that dying and being with Christ was gain. And we can read how Paul was torn in 23 and 24 where it says, For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Interestingly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18 say these words. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, this is talking about the whole church being gathered together on that wonderful day. And Paul here is exhorting the church to encourage one another with these words. In this verse in Philippians, it's slightly different. He's thinking of what happens to the individual Christian upon death, whilst the whole church will experience the same. What awaits us after death is immeasurably more than what we know of in this life. The joy that comes from thinking about eternity with Christ what he has done for us, what he has gone and head and prepared that place for us, that we will see him face to face. There'll be no more suffering, no more sin. I could go on. Does this not fill you Christians with joy? We're going home. We will see Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Saviour. Well, the alternative is fruitful labour for me. Paul has set up a ministry that spanned different continents, countries, and cities. And Paul says in verse 25, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance of joy and joy of faith. Because of this expansive ministry, and when we read the different epistles that Paul wrote, the individual needs of the churches that he had founded They needed him to keep going. He was often rebuking, correcting, and encouraging some of these struggling churches. And therefore, if he continued, it would prove fruitful labor for him. And I think we see in verse 25 that this is what convinced him, as I mentioned earlier, that he would be released to continue his ministry. But there is something that we can take from this ourselves, believers. We may be torn between the two ourselves. But if God has chosen to keep us in this life, He wants us to live our lives that will encourage other Christians to grow. You may not be able to do what you once did. Attend the many meetings or support the youth or children's work and so on. But we can still encourage uh, each other and spur each other on in the Christian life. Which is why Paul writes in verse 26 that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He will have encouraged them to grow as Christians. Can we do the same for one another? Well, finally tonight, in verses 27 to 30, we see Paul's whole purpose of writing to the Philippian church. He's been building up to this point. He's saying, do not forget what Christ has ultimately done for you. He suffered greatly. He gave up his life for you. He rose from the dead to beat death sting, 
and now because of all of this, we can get right with God. And Paul is then saying, this is how I've shaped my life. Because of what Christ has done for me, I've rejoiced in the situations and circumstances that God has placed me in for the furtherance of his great gospel. Therefore, because of this, whatever situation is placed before you, churches around us becoming more liberal, loss of jobs, family and friends because of your faith, ill health, poverty, a difficult family life, wanting to be close to your children and grandchildren and so on. Embrace these situations and, and circumstances and keep standing on the truth. So Paul starts by saying in verse 27, only let your conversation be that it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Well, we have a high calling. Paul doesn't need to be with them for them to act in the right way. So he says, whether I am with you or not, you must conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And Paul is telling them that he knows the struggles and persecutions that's going on in Philippi. He's experienced the struggles and opposition we face day by day today as we seek to spread the gospel. But regardless of his opposition, we must all conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And it's a theme that Paul expresses not just in Philippians, but in a number of his epistles. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 2 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 we don't live our lives this way to get something out of God but we must live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so the outside world see the transforming work of God in us and see is a different, and it draws others to God. God is able to keep transforming us, making us more Christ-like. Well, as verse 1 gave us the title, Saints, that we're sanctified and set apart. You belong to a heavenly people. Remember this in your daily lives. Remember how God has worked in you and transformed you. Remember where you belong. In verse 28, we see that we should expect opposition. In verse 28, Paul tells us two things. Firstly, that we should not be frightened by opposition. And secondly, we can see in this verse, we don't need to become overwhelmed by it either. Because it's a mark of destruction for those that are against God. But it's also a mark for the Christian that you will be saved. And we can take some joy and comfort in that certainty. And in verse 29, we're told... Not only do we believe in him, but we're expected to suffer for him. It's an expectation. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 backs it up. It says, For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing, than for evil-doing. And then Paul concludes in verse 30, he says, Having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. In other words, all of what I've told you is true. The struggles we are both going through is proof of what I have said, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is all true, and that because of these struggles and circumstances each, are, uh, uh, each of us are in, the gospel will advance, and there is great joy in that. So as I close, remember that God has placed you in different situations or different circumstances some of which we will find difficult. We may even face severe persecution, and we do not know God's reasons for it. But God knows best, and we need to make sure that we continue to show the outside world a Christ-like attitude. So stand firm and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that his glorious gospel will continue to advance. There is great joy to be found in that.
Amen.